Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders Intermediate Series. Today is episode 23 and we're going to be discussing the Chinese bamboo rat snake, Oreo cryptophis, Porphyrosius valanti. Just amazing, absolutely amazing looking snake. Bamboo rat snakes are becoming more and more popular and more readily available than ever before. People are cracking how to breed them and they're finding their way into uh, shops, and breeders markets and such like and you know it's important that we cover a few notes on these so that we know what we're doing. Their colours are just beyond belief, they're absolutely breathtaking and this video and the camera won't do this snake justice, it's popping bright red, beautiful with these peach flanks and a lovely porcelain off-white belly, just absolutely phenomenal looking. Most people would have expected us to probably cover their cousin first, which is the Thai bamboo rat snake, and by far and away the most popular of the Oreo cryptophis available in the hobby. But, you know, we just do these videos as the animals become available in the shop, and we like to do subspecies specific information. So, you know, I'm sure in time we will do Coxie or the Thai bamboos when they're available. So this is a secretive and shy snake that shuns high temperatures and consistent exposure to higher temperatures can cause us some real issues. In fact, it can lead to death in certain cases. So, you know, we've got to be really careful where we place these in the house to make sure that they do okay. And it's this sensitivity to temperature that precludes it and potentially always will from the introducing series. You know, um, it, it really is uh, problematic for them to be warm. So I can't really overstate that. Um, the rest of their care actually is, is, is not too, too much of an issue. It is just the temperature. But it's enough of an issue for uh, me and Paul to kind of hold fast and be like, can it go in the introducing series? And if we're both being honest, no. No, it can't. It's not, it's not a beginner snake. It's not a top end intermediate species by any means, but it's not a beginner species. For the most part, feeding's unproblematic and defrost mammalian prey is readily accepted. But this snake has a small head and doesn't want large prey and it can put them off and they can become a bit gun shy if you give them too big a meal. So you're probably better off feeding multiple smaller prey items. Similar to the Russian rat snake, when they come out and they are active in their natural range, they have got very fast metabolisms because they need to turn that food around, get it stored and get the energy from it. So they can be quite productive with waste. And, you know, adults such as this, you'd feed every seven days. Babies, you'd feed every five days um, just to try and lay that weight onto them. There is going to be a protracted period where we don't feed them, which we'll discuss at a slightly later point. Babies can be a little bit more difficult to get going and patience may be required, but eventually they will kick in. There, um, there may well be the need, in fact, to brew mate the babies before we fully establish them on food uh, with that resultant cold snap trying to break that fasting cycle and then uh, kick them in uh, and, and that, that cool intrusion can really set them going. And a lot of people utilise that for the animals that come from the cooler climates. Um, maximum adult size for the species is between 80 centimetres and 100 centimetres for girls, and the male's generally smaller. This is a pretty much full grown male, and he would quite happily breed, and he is barely 65, 70 centimetres long. Uh, the males lose their crossbars, which you probably can't even see on here. We've got the faint outlines one there one there and maybe just one there coming across um, and they they lose it and all they retain are these dorsal uh, flank stripes which are a deeper red they're not black Thai bamboos are black and they look like they've had a permanent marker line drawn down their back these guys this is more of a uh, a deeper uh, red or maroon uh, it's definitely not black They've got a stripe that comes through the eye and they have a central um, stripe that runs through the parietals, but that stops 
at the end of the head and does not continue. Can you see that middle stripe in the head? So these are our identifying markers. Girls will retain far more of the cross banding, but they do fade. As babies, they are very strongly patterned and it's over time that these bands fade off and you probably won't be able to make it out but we can see these slightly darker red stripes here uh, on the babies they're far more orange rather than red with the base red here being the colour of the original stripes and the crossbars are a very very dark brown not a true black and these are what fade off so you can see just how much they fade as they grow and reach maturity. The males, in fact, look like they're just twin striped. The girls would retain some hollow elements. The middle of the stripes tend to lighten off and maybe the outer remnants and lines uh, delineating them and showing them will remain on girls. Um, so, temperament can be mixed. This one's a joy, wonderful and tame. Some can be a little bit stroppy, but for the most part, it's an intermediate species. It is what it is, who cares? Um, it's not a big snake, it can't do you any harm, so we're not going to worry about temperament. Not really uh, an issue in an intermediate snake. Eggs are laid in a damp hide or under a log in their enclosure where the female will just loosely coil them. It's not like a, a true uh, maternal incubation, but they just sort of sit and protect them. Uh, the artificial incubation temperature is 26 degrees Celsius. They hatch after 55 to 65 days. Uh, don't be tempted to breed your females too young. Um, males will breed from 18 months uh, and you could end up getting caught out. Uh, small female equals small eggs equals headaches because then you've got small babies who will be problematic to start off. Once you start that breeding ball rolling with this species, it can be hard to stop. And in captivity, at least, they have proven to be prolific breeders, laying multiple clutches of eggs per season, up to three or four. And care must be taken not to deplete the reserves of your female. A brumation will help to define the end of the season. A period of fattening up should be undertaken prior to breeding trials the following season so that we lay enough weight and fat rapidly onto the female for this coming egg season. And when we look at the, the climate data later, this is almost certainly a, a captivity thing because there just simply isn't the time in the year for the multiple clutches. So this is an adaptation to us giving them wonderful clement level temperatures and then a brumation uh, it allows them to fit multiple clutches in not that we should nor should we really encourage it so but also there is the possibility of retained sperm with girls so they may do it anyway so it's a balancing act trying to work out what's best for the girls and sometimes they'll produce eggs if they feel that they've got the reserves to do it after all they are uh, you know naturally want to spread their genes and dna as best as possible um, there are similar species who uh, are from further south near the equator. There is Collignathus helena, which is the trinket snake, and there is uh, Lamprophis uh, fuligosus or Boedon fuligosus, uh, and uh, Boedon uh, is it lineatus and olivaceus, which are the African house snakes. Um, and these are multi multi clutches. They lay loads of eggs. But that kind of makes sense for where they're from. This guy being halfway up a Chinese mountain, it's a bit odd and it just seems to be a, a, a captivity adaptation. Um, the brumation process where they're from is uh, Montane, southeastern China. They are almost certainly going to have a brumation and potentially we are going to need to involve things like fridges that we can keep them in. And this isn't something to be scared of, it's just something that you need to gear up for. Um, and it just helps to keep the animals in good nick and researching other taxa such as Tamnophis has shown that it can increase longevity to go through the brumation process. You must research brumation properly with all species that, that, that brumate because we have a period of non-feeding and regular bathing so that we can clear out their uh, digestive tract. Then we go through a process over the period of a month or six weeks of lowering them from their regular temperature down as low as we can get them. Then they transition into hibernaculum, which is the fridge. They'll stay in the hibernaculum for two and a half, three months. And then we take six weeks to raise them back up to their normal operating temperature, at which point we resume feeding. Certain care sheets I've read 
people continue to feed them during a brumation period. I think this is a ridiculous, risky piece of advice and therefore don't support it. Um, and you can really uh, cause problems with rotting food inside the digestive tract of the snakes, whilst I'm sure that there are adaptations for them to be able to digest at cooler temperatures, not when we're talking about single digits Celsius, no. So uh, yeah, no food during brumation. So Chinese species in general can be a pain to find real detail on. China's refusal to allow Google hampers things and makes reference maps unreliable. Certain regions have now been renamed, which also just helps to make life more complicated. Uh, thanks to Francis, personal communication, Francis Kaskiri, who helped me uh, with that information because I was drawing a blank. Uh, and, you know, me and Paul, we were, we were trying to research it and just not getting anywhere. The obvious tool for us to use for this species is uh, the monograph of genus Alafi Fitzinger by Klaus Dyer Schultz. Sadly, this species was not yet described, so that was another disappointment. Notes were included on their cousin, uh, also known as the Chinese bamboo rat snake, uh, which was at the time Alafe porphyracea nigrofasciata, so black banded bamboo rat snake. This has since been reclassified back into the nominant form porphyracea porphyracea by Love in 2010. So. We can probably safely assume that some of the notes for Nigro Fasciata in uh, Schultz's book are actually in reference to Volanti. This species' natural distribution includes southeastern China, including the provinces of. Now, please, if you're Chinese, I am not trying to offend you. I can barely speak English, so I'm going to try my best, okay? Provinces of Guangdong, Guangxi, Fujian. Zhejiang, Guizhou, Hunan, Yangtze, Yangzhou, Anhui, Hanan Island, and Hong Kong. I managed the last one, okay. This is a montane species, preferring secondary moist, evergreen, and deciduous forests and bamboo forests. They lead a secretive and fossorial life. Fossorial means burrowing. Under the moss, uh, mats of moss, Branches, leaf litter and fallen trees. Climate data has been our sticking block. We can quote verbatim the temperatures recommended on other care sheets, but what we and, and what we use in store when we keep them ourselves. But we need to know why we do it. And that's why we offer the climate data and I go and try and find it for you on these videos. And it's proven to be a pain in the ass. Southeast China is a network of small mountains, foothills and valleys. So first off, I needed to print out a topographic map of Southeast China and using the elevation guide, work out what regions within the natural range, this is the natural range, the pink line of Porphyrosius Volanti. Then we'll try and find the regions that matched the elevations quoted in the texts on them. So anything from, what, what, what did it end up being? 500 to 2,000 meters. So here we go. As it turns out, nearly all the data points that I can find were in valleys well under 250 meters in elevation, where daytime highs would regularly reach 33, 34 degrees. So completely useless. We can't use them for our video. Um, so we managed to find one, which was uh, Guiyang in Guizhou province, which is the first blue dot. Uh, and I returned to somebody who has got actual knowledge of the region uh, and from visits and protracted uh, personal research and study for his own animals, Francis Koskiri again. Uh, and a second site, second site more associated with another subspecies, um, but within the elevation range for the subspecies was suggested in Yunnan. So we used the two to present the data here. Site A is Guiyang in Guizhou province, which has an elevation of 1100 meters. Site B is here, which is the other blue dot, which is Dalong Tan, Yunnan. But we couldn't get exactly to Dalong Tan, so we had to use Kuna, uh, Kunming in Yunnan with an elevation of 1900 meters, so right at the 
top of the elevation that these snakes can occur from. Dalong Tan is actually around 1100 meters, but Kung Ming was the nearest data point. And at this point, beggars can't be choosers, but we prefer to not lie and operate with full clarity and not try and present data as something that it's not. So let's have a look at the climate data. We've got the table here so we can see our daytime high, nighttime low fluctuation. So fluctuation is the difference between daytime high and nighttime low in degrees the median temperature across a 24 hour period on average per month and the rainfall levels. So we're peaking out in Guiyang at 28 degrees. I mean, that's the, these are, these are uh, probably in unshaded regions of airports and such like. So we consider micro habitat. They're almost, these snakes are almost certainly not enjoying those sorts of temperatures and they would not be in a microclimate that, that reflects that. But what we're trying to show over the course of a season is the, the overarching curve, the macro data rather than the micro data. So 28 degree peak, seven degree minimum, whereas the Long Tan or Kung Ming, even though it's higher, is far more balanced. Not quite as high with a peak of 25 Celsius, but its minimum is 16 Celsius. So as far as fluctuation goes, it's um, a lot more uh, stable throughout the year. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but then it really, really uh, drops off through winter uh, and there's quite a marked change. But at night, we're still looking at 18 to 20 degrees Celsius, 17 degrees Celsius. So it isn't dropping off as mad as we would expect at those sorts of elevations. Your daytime high curve delineates that we've got probably, here's around our 12, 13 degree mark. This is our, our brumation period. So, you know, we've got at least three or four months where we're going to be hidden away nighttime low averages again so we are here so yeah we're spending a good portion of the year uh, predominantly inactive not really able to hunt we haven't got energy that's commensurate for it median temperatures so we're going through our daytime highs 24s and 21s they're within the realms of where we would keep them anyway we usually use a basking spot of 26 celsius and then allow them to move away from that and cool down if you've got an established reptile collection, you'd be keeping it in an unheated box within the room where it benefits from the, the latent heat given off from the other animals, whilst not necessarily receiving any direct heat of their own. So they would probably be to anything from 23 to 25 Celsius, and that would generally be fine. Um, rainfall shows considerable change throughout the year with our peak rainy season, May, June, July, August. Uh, peak rainfall in Guiyang is 180 millimetres in a single month. Manchester, UK in January gets something like 37 mil. So considerably different. Uh, and at this elevation, they're in the cloud forests as well, where the clouds would regularly drop their, uh, their load as they run into these mountains. So incredibly moist and damp, but not necessarily uh, overly hot, but expect the humidity to be high as a, as a um, result of this. So we would, we're going to have to uh, cycle these animals. We're going to have to cool them right down, um, if only to protect the female and for it to be more commensurate to their natural climate. Um, people ask often, do I need to brew mate if I'm not breeding? Well, current research, particularly with the Tamnophis stuff is, well, yeah, because it's, it's better for their health but people haven't been doing it for 30 years and they've kept animals for years. The risks are you could potentially end up with an obese animal or um, other such problems uh, from not giving them the inactivity. You could deplete a female stores because she continues to lay, lay eggs permanently. So this is also a problem. So uh, this species was first described by Sauvage in 1877 as Simotes volanti. Genus changes have included Alaphi, Holacris, and Oreophis before settling on Oreocryptophis. It was last confirmed as Oreocryptophis porphyrisius volanti in 2010 by Orlov, meaning that the, and, and the meaning of the name or the etymology is Greek, Oros meaning mountain, Kryptos meaning secret or hidden, and Ophis or Ufis meaning snake. So, Chinese bamboo rat snake, Oreo cryptophis, Porphyrisius volanti. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it interesting. Uh, we've got 
all the data which we'll hopefully share, like certainly on the Facebook page, um, we're, we're trying to help people with their research and these are the sorts of things that you can look at to infer how to run your year and how you think that maybe your setup needs to go as big intermediate or advanced keepers a lot of it's about interpretation of data or fact we read books that present where a snake's from what it feeds on its habitat and then from there we rock and roll you don't necessarily need that oh it's this oh it's that because as experienced keepers we're working it out that's what makes us experienced keepers so as an intermediate snake you know this is where we are 1500 to 2000 meters in elevation cloud forest and bamboo forest on these foothills and small mountains in the southeast of china data is hard to come by but the data that we could find is here i hope it's helpful do your research as always from paul and Chaz at snakes and adders thank you very much and to francis for your help cheers <laughs>